I'm a great respecter of the knowledge and the insight and the understanding of nature that has been delivered to us via the medium of, of mythology, that that's going to be an important. Modern science has lots of gaps. And I think mythology has the potential of filling some of those gaps in our understanding of the natural order of things in which we find ourselves existing. Randall, welcome back. Well, thanks for having me back, Matt, and putting putting up with me again. Happy to put up with you. Uh, I hope some Space Force personnel are listening today. We're going to uh, continue with the discussion that we began in part one um, that I think is going to take a turn now towards the heavens. And uh, it's it's uh, I'm hoping to get into some of the topics that, in fact, first planted the idea in my mind to even have you come out and, and introduce you to the Space Force community so we could start to properly orient ourselves uh, here down on terra firma with some of the uh, the grander context, things that are happening out in the cosmos and in the near, in our neck of the woods, in the nearby uh, solar system. But you said something at the end of the last episode. I'll start with this. You said geologists focus on what's under our feet. Astronomers tend to focus on what's above our heads. And um, that's important and good, but there's something missing when you do that, isn't there? And I, I'd like to tease that out. Why is it important, perhaps, for someone who's seeking understanding to maybe try and integrate into their worldview all of this information? Well, I, I think if we look at the history of, of human societies on this planet, we see certain themes repetitive over and over again. Um, one of those themes is that our ancestors all over the planet were almost obsessively interested in what happened in the sky. That was a major component of their belief systems, their religion. You know, the, all of that was very much uh, about the changing of the uh, the events in the sky, which could be any number of things. And we, we kind of briefly touched, I think, in the previous episode about this, the great year model. Uh, and we can segue back to that at some point, because I think it provides a very valuable and potent framework for thinking about events on a larger scale. And so we could come back to that. And of course, that's the thing that's gotten sort of, uh, you know, cliched in popular culture with the ideas of, you know, the age of Aquarius and all of that kind of stuff that uh, has been almost rendered meaningless within that framework of co of pop culture. But it actually refers to an astronomical process, which is the uh, the westward movement of the uh, vernal equinox, the point of vernal equinox in the sky, which is drifting at about 50 arc seconds per year in the direction that's more or less reverse to most of the celestial motion we see. If we look at the diurnal movement of the sun in the sky or daily movement, it's moving from west to east. I'm sorry, from east... But, a little bit of my dyslexia kicking in. It's coming in with age. <laughs> um, it, it, you know, it moves from east to west. Uh, planetary movement is pretty much the same. Um, back up. Am I saying this right? Well, it rises in the east and, and moves travel travels west. But don't the but every day, for example, the moon it seems is rising slightly later, and so it's kind of traveling westward across the sky. Right? Is that right? Eastward. Eastward. I mean, sorry, eastward across the sky. Yeah. See, I've got a, I've got a issue. This is of, tricky for people to wrap their minds around. It is, <laughs> and and I have to issue a caveat here that, like, normally this might actually be my afternoon nap time. So it's a little, <laughs> get a little bit. Um, yeah, after working, I usually come in and I sit down in my big easy chair for thirty minutes and go off. I'm not doing that. So I'm making a great sacrifice to well, be thank here. You. I'm missing my afternoon nap. But but the fact that someone who knows it so well can get tripped up with these concepts just goes to prove the point that like even for our Space Force professionals, it's difficult to, to picture in their mind oh, yeah. what it is that you're talking about. So while the sun rises in the east and moves westward throughout the course of any given day, what is this eastward motion that you're talking about then that, that's happening overhead? We start with the moon. If we look at the moon each day, we're seeing that it's moving um, from west to east. In against the backdrop of the zodiacal band, which are the twelve 
uh, constellation. So it's moving to the east. Then if we look at the daily movement of the sun, not that caused by the rotation of the earth, because that's what makes the sun appear to rise in the east and set in the west. But if we look at the daily motion of the sun, we see also it's moving west to, to east. Also, if we look at the planets, we see them moving west to east. Um, except with an exception, and I'm not going to try to explain that now, but that's um, when when the planets go retrograde. And it's really just an illusion of when our, when the Earth is lapping a planet, like Mars, for example. When Earth is lapping, Mars is out in its orbit, and it's moving. Earth is moving faster, and it laps. For, uh, for a short period of time, it will appear, it will create the illusion that Mars is moving backwards against the, the sky. Um, but it's not really. It's not obviously stopping in its orbit, moving backwards. It's an illusion. But other than that, everything's moving from west to east, except the vernal, the, the equinoxes and the solstices, which are moving uh, towards the west. And so the term precession, to, to contrast it with procession, if procession is west to east, precession is east to west. So in ancient cultures, they were very, very interested in the, these four points on that within that circle that represent the two solstices and at right angles to them, the two equinoxes. And they would consider that the equinox kind of marked the beginning of the year, generally, as a rule. Um, and this was you know, we associate the uh, spring equinox now. We have, um, you know, which occurs right around March 21st, March 22nd, right in there. And then we have summer solstice, which is in June. So they kind of looked at an analogy between the Earth year and this processional cycle, which was referred to as the Great Year. And if you want to know more about that whole um, that whole phenomena of ancient cultures and their um, their observations of the heavens and the, and the great year, the book Hamlet's Mill that came out in 1969 is the one that you would want to, uh, let's see what you got. Why? There it is right there. Move it over just a little bit as it says, uh, essay investigating the origins of human knowledge and its transmission through myth. That's a very important idea that, um, this idea that prior to that, nobody considered as a rule, as a general rule, mainstream anthropology um, did not look at, at myth as being anything that had a scientific basis to it. It was really more indicative of the, the ignorance of ancient cultures uh, in scientific terms. And so a lot of the myths were, you know, imagined by our modern scholars to be concoctions of the ancient mind attempting to come to grips with forces and processes in nature that they didn't understand. And so they kind of conjured up these fantastical scenarios. Well, 1969, with the publication of Hamlet's Mill, that was kind of a major milestone in reevaluating what ancient peoples, what their, their, their methodology of myth was all about. And so we've come a long way since then. There's even now a, uh, you know, there are actually emerging scientific disciplines. One, for example, geomythology, where geologists are actually diving into ancient myths and realizing that there's a treasure trove of legitimate geological information and data to be found in the uh, in the ancient myths. Likewise, astromythology kind of it shows is the same idea is that their myths about the stars and the planets and the motions of the heavens actually contain extremely valuable data and that they weren't as ignorant about matters of science, especially observational science, as as had been imagined. So I have found that, you know, going back to some of the ancient sources is a, a very uh, fruitful way of gaining insight. But at the same time, you don't want to neglect the modern the findings of modern science because I think within this framework of thinking about you know a greater respect for the knowledge of our ancestors, we're seeing sort of complementary disciplines with modern observational science, which includes the data that we can now access through technology that we couldn't you know 
a half a century or a century ago with LIDAR and ground penetrating radar and scanning electron microscopes and X-ray diffraction and all of these technologies that now allow us to see, you know, our, the telescopes that now allow us to see the larger macro scale world, the microscopes that allow us to see the micro scale world. And we're seeing this broad spectrum of, of phenomena that was not available to humans a few generations ago. And so right. we, when we just started this discussion, you brought up the, the thing that I said about, you know, geologists are looking at what's going on beneath our feet. Astronomers are looking at what's going on in the sky. And I think we're rediscovering this important connection between the two domains, the two realms, yeah. the terrestrial realm and the celestial realm that was so critically important to our ancestors. And I think there's a reason for that, and we'll come back to that. But in a nutshell, I think the reason is that um, that there have been times, epochs, um, throughout the history of this planet when things going on in the sky have been a lot more intense, a lot more um, active than, mm -hmm. than what has occurred that we've seen in the last few centuries. And if uh, this is the case, then it's likely that there were times when our ancestors were witnessing things occurring in the heavens that, and, and felt directly the consequences of the things that was, were occurring in he the heavens. Right. And when you have a tradition of this, if you have an epoch during which, and, and, and in fact, there is a, a whole model out there of, of change in the solar system that is beginning to recognize, um, I think uh, the the British, what I call the British neo catastrophist Victor Klub and William Napier and oh, there's a, about a half a dozen of these guys that have been looking at um, celestial phenomena for oh thirty or forty years now and have concluded that there are actually what they refer to as bombardment epochs. There are periods of time where the amount of uh, Earth crossing material is enhanced by an order of magnitude or more. And during that, those periods of time, the, the possibility of Earth encountering this material goes up dramatically. So what is it that causes that, um, that opportunity, I guess, uh, that makes it so different from our mundane interaction with the cosmos in our lifetime, in a seven, roughly speaking, 72-year span? Uh, you know, wh what are those periods then, and, and does that in your view, tie into the great year, uh, is there some way to predict that? And then maybe we could get into a discussion of the, uh, the most recent and I, I'd say exceptionally catastrophic, uh, destructive phase, which is known as the younger Dryas. Uh, so if we can get into some of that as well, I think that would be helpful for people to gain an appreciation of just how destructive some of these uh, events can be. We really do need to, to dive into the younger Dryas because that's, it's been, Tim, I would say one of the most controversial scientific uh, ideas of the last, say, 20 years. Uh, and it's had a lot of resistance. And I think the resistance is coming from those who have, you know, who are very invested in the gradualistic models. And once you dive into it, you realize that there are political implications to some of these things. It's when we were talking the other day about, in the other uh, episode, about the Cretaceous tertiary events, when the dinosaurs went extinct. You know, that was controversial in itself. But one of the things that kind of made that a little bit more uh, digestible to the critics was the fact that it was so far removed from our modern experience, removed from humans, other than the fact that it maybe cleared off the dominance of the dinosaurs and allowed the rise of mammals. It didn't really have any political implications other than the fact of moving from this strict gradualism into an acceptance that on some scale, catastrophic events are possible, right? But as, as I mentioned yesterday in some of our closing comments, what's happened in the interim is that we've gone from realizing that cosmic impacts and events on that scale have played an important role in the history of this planet, but we've neglected the... Uh, counterpart of that, which is the role that these events have played in human history. And it's the evidence grows every year that these kinds of events, uh, encounters with things from space is way more prevalent than anybody was imagining, you know, a generation or two ago. And, um, what this has led to the realization that, um, perhaps civilizations can 
begin to evolve in these uh, intervals between these c- catastrophic events. Um, you know, I think I've heard the the analogy of you know soldiers at war being described as long periods of boredom interrupted by short periods of terror. And I think that's a very useful metaphor for the kinds of things we're talking about. And it's really, it's in those long periods of boredom that civilizations can arise. And then when the things, when things shift, this is when civilizations collapse. Long periods of, of boredom, maybe in combination with a warmer climate. Yeah. When they, yeah. Because, because isn't there a fluctuation or a kind of, uh, I mean, I don't know, a kind of uh, repeating pattern even there, the, the, the warmer interglacial periods, and then you, you plunge into cold. Yes, And uh, yes. humans have been resilient through a lot of things, but it seems like those are, um, I don't know if you'd call it a kind of sine wave, because uh, I don't think it looks exactly like that, but you have uh, peaks and valleys of sorts uh, throughout geological history uh, in the temperature variance of the Earth. Yes. So I am, since you said that in the peaks and the valleys, I think I'm going to attempt to do a share screen here. Okay. You were talking about peaks and valleys. So then I immediately thought of this graph, which goes back quite a number of years, but it's one of the first graphs that really show the succession of uh, climatic changes as, as, um, as uh, preserved in sea surface temperatures, which there's a number of ways you can determine sea surface temperature, and it, it primarily has to do with the type of flora and fauna that was living in the water column at the time, because you'll have warm-loving species, you'll have cold-loving species, and so by analyzing the, 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 the marine fossils, you can tell what kind of ocean temperatures. That's, that's one proxy. But as it says here, this is a generalized temperature curve for surface uh, water of the Central Caribbean, and the numbers above the horizontal axis, whoops, would be uh, referred to stages within the larger. So you you go from epochs to stages. Okay, you go from periods to epochs to stages, and each one is finer uh, degrees of resolution. And so you can see here you've got peaks and troughs, and if we come, it's it's you know, 400,000 years ago to the right. And then as you come down zero, zero is the present whenever this was built. Yes. And you can actually see here, this is the, um, this is the medieval warm period, right? So we're here. talking a half a millennium ago or a little more than that. Yes. There was a peak. Yes. There was a peak. And then there was a trough that was coincided with, kind of pretty much the dark ages and then there was another peak that coincided with the roman warm period now, i'm wondering actually before you go backwards in time to the right you know where this mm-hmm. y-axis stops you see that after the medieval warm period it, there's this decline in temperature how long does that continue before it begins to warm back up again to the you know to roughly speaking our modern uh climate well we'll get into that um it's it's a pretty fast process actually But let me see if I've got this. Yeah, okay, so the red line basically represents the modern warmth. And so what you can see there, if you go back the past 400,000 years, is that we've been in the grip of uh, a glacial mode. And you can see that these periods of of warmth are very actually quite short-lived within the larger framework of of, uh, climatic change. So you can think of it this way. The trough here would represent like a glacial epoch, and this would be an interglacial. And then these, in the, these, these intermediate ones, there's a term I'll introduce you to. It's called stadial and interstadial. So in this graph, you'll have large peaks and large troughs, okay? And that'll be interglacial, full glacial. And then within those, you'll have... Uh, peaks and troughs of lesser amplitude. And so a stade is a period of cold, but not a full glacial. And an interstade is a period of warmth, but not a full-blown warm period like we're in right now. 
so that's just so you've got in the extreme you've got glacial interglacial stadial interstadial so these are just the terms that they use um so like one of the questions would be um when you go back to canada which was the location of the great ice sheet um the old version is that you know you had at least a hundred thousand years of unbroken ice age and glacial mantling of half of North America. But then coming in the 70s uh, and 80s with the um, you know advent of radiocarbon dating, I mean, which actually goes back to the 50s, but it took a decade or two to accumulate enough database to start making conclusions and or, or you know coming with um, insights into the, the dynamic nature of global change. It became apparent that um, it wasn't a long 100,000 or 200,000 year period of, of, you know, full glacial cold, and it was actually um, interspersed with periods of warmth. And so there are a lot of studies that began to come out in the 70s and 80s showing that um, where it was assumed that there had been a mile of ice 40,000 years ago, there were forests growing there, which then really changed the whole conception of this thing because the belief was, and and we talked about this uh, in the for our first conversation, this idea of the Little Ice Age, and the fact that the Little Ice Age has been the coldest, uh, say, seven or eight hundred years of the entire Holocene, which is the last eleven thousand years. Okay, so and within that period of cold, the glaciers worldwide expanded to their largest extent in the entire Holocene. The Holocene is the it's actually dated to about the, the onset of the Holocene, the modern epoch, climatic epoch, is dated to about 11,000 to 11,600 years ago. And what differentiates it from the previous Pleistocene, again, is this, this idea of, of glacial cold that was assumed to have gripped the planet throughout the entire Pleistocene. Well, the Pleistocene is two and a half million years long. And it was preceded by the Pliocene epoch. And one of the things that sort of defines that transition between Pliocene and Pleistocene is this onset of this oscillating climatic change between glacier and interglacial, okay. between stadial and interstadial. And so the, the appearance and the growth of the great ice sheets is one of the primary characteristics that defines the Pleistocene epoch. Okay. So... The question could be asked, is the Holocene really a unique epoch unto or itself, or is it really just a, a stage within the What's Pleistocene? Your view? And I don't my view is that it's probably just a stage within the Pleistocene, unless anthropogenic influences perhaps um there is some evidence that glaciers have not really ice ages have not really had the, the same uh, grip over planetary climate they've had once carbon dioxide concentrations get about above about 500 parts per million. That's a whole other discussion sure. that would be very interesting to have. Um, it, but I think if, if humans were not a factor, I think we would, you know, I think we're probably would be headed back for another episode of right. glacial cold, um, which would suck. Yeah. <laughs> to put it mildly. Um, so anyway, so here's your this graph. The red line represents the, the modern warmth. And you can see these intervals of modern warmth are relatively short. Right. That's, that's an important takeaway from this. So now let's go to another graph here. And this is going back to the 19... Uh, early 1990s when uh, there was a European team and an American team that were um, uh, extracting... Uh, uh, um, extracting, they were they were digging boreholes, boring holes through the ice to the bottom of the glacier, and it took oh five, I think it was about five seasons of of drilling to extract these core samples. There, you got a picture. They're about you know four or five inches in diameter, and they're they're layered because as the snow falls, like say over Greenland. Um, it compresses and then it forms layers that can actually be counted very much as uh, tree ring, dendrochronology, um, looks at tree rings and you can extract a lot of information about ambient environmental conditions by looking at 
tree rings. You know, obviously in a very simple interpretation, if you have a nice big fat layer of growth, uh, that means that there was likely a lot of rainfall. If you have a series of very narrow bands within the tree rings, it would be interpreted as a period of drought or other conditions that are detrimental to the to the growth of uh, of of trees. But anyway, so ice cores are very similar in that you have this layering that, you, and then within that layering, you can extract a lot of information because dust accumulates, some um, pollen accumulates, uh, isotopes. Now this is based on the oxygen isotope ratios that are uh, found in the ice. I won't get into really trying to explain that. We could do that, maybe dive into that in another conversation. But basically, uh, oxygen isotopes between oxygen 16, oxygen 18, um, what happens is oxygen 18 is a, is, is, is a heavier isotope than oxygen 16. And so when you have periods of, let's say, of, of cooling, what will happen is that the uh, the hydrodynamic processes that are um, you know um, evaporating water from the oceans they become mitigated and with the less energy the heavier oxygen isotopes will get selectively uh, left back within the ocean so then what happens is the, the rainfall will carry the signature of that I oxygen isotopic uh, condition it falls on the uh, it'll fall as snow. And then it's preserved, and that isotopic ratio is preserved in the snow. So, what you can do is you can you can extract temperature information be, uh, through the relative um, proportions of heavy oxygen to lighter oxygen, oxygen eighteen to oxygen sixteen. That's what's going on here. Relative oxygen isotope ratio shifts to the left mean that it's getting colder. Shifts to the right mean it's getting warmer. This this column on the right is years in uh, thousands of years. So this ends at 10,000 years. You can see down here, 10,000 years. Here's a, here's a, a little bit of a, uh, some of the stuff that was going on, start of the pyramid age in Europe. I mean, in Egypt. Um, as far back as, as human recorded history, though, you can see this flux these, these peaks and valleys, I mean, it's it's standing up on end here, but there's warm periods, cold periods, and, and it's, yeah, it's just back it's and forth, oscillating back and forth, constantly. Yeah, some of these larger oscillations, like this one right here, that's at about 8,300, this, this was a cold spell um, that represents about a four degree, three to four degree Celsius change um, in a very short period of time. And yeah, here the important takeaway from this is that you see temperature oscillating between one and three degrees, typically constantly up and down, up and down, up and down. You don't see a smooth straight line here. What you see is now this, of course, is Greenland. Now, the the you could you could the criticism might be, well, can you extrapolate from Greenland to the rest of the planet? And I think the answer is, with some qualifications, yes, you can, um, because you're not going to have climatic change that's just centered over one specific region because the entire climate of the earth is is a single system so it's almost certain that the that the climatic changes recorded in the greenland ice cores are at least hemispheric if not global and i think the 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 uh evidence now is definitely trending towards the realization that these are global you know one of the original uh criticisms of the Younger Dryas was it was just regional. You know, if you go back and you read 20 to 30 years ago when the Younger Dryas was first really becoming a an issue amongst environmentalists, climatologists, and geologists and others, the question was, well, we're seeing these Younger Dryas, which is, um, you know, was pretty much uh, reflected in climatic change over Europe, but, you know, wasn't global. But the fact of the matter is now we know it was global because we see younger dryas signals showing up in, for example, New Zealand. And it's not going to show up in North America, Europe, in New Zealand without being global. There's even yeah, evidence of younger dryas signal showing up in Antarctica. So, I mean, it's, I think at this point we can safely conclude that it's definitely global. So, but I, and I'll also mention we, we were using the term younger dryas which implies that there was an older Dryas. We'll look at a graph here in a minute that, that will show show that. But 
Dryas is, uh, refers to a polar wildflower called Dryas octopetala, which is an eight-petaled flower that loves cold weather. So when gl during glacial ages, it's growing in the vicinity of the glaciers. And then when you have warm periods, it either disappears in a given region or it migrates to the north, trying to stay with the cold. So what happened was there was an older Dryas in which the Dryas octopetala flower was prevalent in northern Europe. And then the older Dryas gave way to the Balling, and that gave way to the Alarod, as they're called. And these were stages, and these were periods of warmth, and Dryas octopetala disappeared. But then at the younger Dryas, all of a sudden, boom, young, uh, Dryas octopetala comes back again. Okay, so the, the, the younger Dryas is the more modern or the more recent age of the Dryas yes. octop... Yes. Did you call it the octopetala? Octopetella. Octopetella. Octo, like eight petals. Eight petals, literally, is what it means. So the more petals. recent of those ages and is, is roughly when? We're talking 11,000 years ago? Uh, dr the younger Dryas lasted from about 11,600 years ago to about 12,900 years ago. About between 12 and 1,300 years, depending on how you count it. And it had a very abrupt onset and a very abrupt termination. And we'll see that reflected in the graph that I'm, as we go through it here. But right here, you can see, again, the importance of looking at this and realizing that this dynamic oscillation of climate has been the norm. It has been characteristic of global climate change. And it doesn't show. The Greenland ice cores do not support the interpretation of a smooth, steady-state climate. They show that within this range of 1 to 3 degrees, and then there's, like, look, you see this little spike here? Something happened right there, and there was a major warming. Um, I don't see where you're pointing. Didn't... Oh, let's see. There, there it here. is. Sorry. Yeah. Wrong okay. screen. There we go, right there. That's You see that warming spike? Yeah, just over 2,000 years ago. Yeah. So that would have probably... It, it, something else to notice here. Let me see. I think I can go... Okay, so I've turned the same graph on its side. And what you're going to notice here, I'm going to put in a, a, a reference line. You can see that we're coming out of the Ice Age over here on the right side of the screen, with the exception of this major dip at about 8,300 years ago, which at this point is still inexplicable. It may have been volcanism shrouding the planet um, and causing this dramatic drop in, in temperature. It may have been some kind of a cosmic event. Maybe, um, you know, if you have an impact event, and it's on land, it tends to cause fires and inject soot and dust into the atmosphere, which reflects solar radiation back into space and causes a cooling. Um, if, it, if, if you have an impact into an ocean, it'll tend to inject water vapor into the atmosphere, which has the opposite effect. Water vapor is a greenhouse gas, and it'll cause a short-lived warming period. But you'll notice that as we're coming from 10,000 years ago up to the modern, two things to notice. One is notice how the it's dipping so that you've got a lot of stuff. So let me see. I think I got to put another line. Here we go. So look at this. Here you see the, the amplitude is on the right side is less than on the left side. And you'll also notice that as it's cooling, it's cooling and the amplitude of the changes, these are mostly decadal and centennial changes, is increasing. As it gets cooler, the amplitude of the climatic changes is increasing. As you go back and it's warming, the amplitude is decreasing. And we find this reflected over and over again in, in uh, historical reconstructions of, of climate change. Um, and that's going to be at some point we'll have that discussion and we'll look at look at that data. Every time I see a graph like this or hear discussion like this, and I've heard you bring up uh, s similar graphs and talk about this on Joe Rogan's podcast, I think it's so unfortunate that in our modern, uh, uh, highly politicized uh, paradigm of uh, human interaction with the climate, these uh, ideas are never presented as a part of the official narrative of what's happening. You you really look at a snapshot of human history. You get to look at maybe the last few years or the last decade or two, but you never really get back into past epochs. Because if you looked in the larger context, you would realize that 
the things that are happening now are, are not unprecedented, but we're being presented with a scenario in which these events, modern events, are unprecedented. Uh, and when you look at the history of climate, the study of paleoclimatology, what you see is that there's nothing, and I don't care what you're talking about, hurricanes, tornadoes, storms, droughts, wildfires, you go down the list, right? There's nothing that's happening now that's unprecedented. Nothing new under the sun. That's correct. That's how I look at it. And, and I think the data fully supports that. What will you do if the grid goes down? How will you survive without food, water, and heat? Introducing One Sunrise, the first of its kind in massive on-demand power, instantly available at any residential, commercial, or remote location. Power your home, your office, your EV, your RV, your farm, your cabin, your bug out bunker, your glamping weekend with the family, or all of them. Bring instant power to any situation, anywhere. Non-toxic, cobalt and lead free, as well as fire resistant, One Sunrise mobile power stations are made to run in over 100 degree temps or at negative 20. For when the grid goes down, there's One Sunrise. Visit onesunrise.com to learn how you can prepare today for no power tomorrow. Um, let's go to the next slide. Here I've, inter I've added some additional information. It's the same graph, and you'll notice I've, what I've done here is I've put into periods of, of warmth, and these would be uh, more like what we would call interstadials, where you have glaciers around the world shrinking and generally periods of climatic warming. And so going back here, this is 10,000 years ago, so we're just coming out of the full depths of the Ice Age, and we had climatic optimum first phase, then there's that 8,200-year-ago cold event right there. You can see that, that little bar, the, the, the lavender bar there represents colder, right? The, the orange is warmer. We come up, the Bronze Age coincides with a generally cool period. Um, and then you have the Pyramid Age, Old Kingdom, Egypt, and Sumer, which generally coincides with a warmer period. Then we have, you see that the Bronze Age here begins roughly 5,000, 5,500 years ago, roughly. Then you have the Bronze Age collapse, which coincides with this period right here, where you go from this warmth into this generally cold period. Then that was followed by a the world Roman warm period and the rise of classical Greece, the Roman Empire. And then between 400 and about 550 A.D., that gave way to the Dark Ages, which you'll see here, classical Greece in the Roman warm period was right here. And then you had this Dark Ages cold period. Then you had a medieval warm period right here, which was the era of the great cathedral building in Europe. And then you had the two phases of the Little Ice Age, broken by, in, uh, interrupted by one warming spell, which coincided with the Renaissance. And so what, what's the date range of that very top uh, bar up there, the second phase of the Little Ice Age. What are we looking at there? And, We're and when do we come about, out of it? About the mid 19th century. Yeah. And so, what's interesting is that when we look at graphs of modern warming, our baseline is the coldest century of the last 10,000 years. Well, think about that. I mean, that, that's a fact. Yeah, that's eye opening. Um, well, this is a valuable, valuable graph. Yeah. Well, let's go on here so you can really begin to appreciate. So, here's the same graph going back to 10,000 years, and then we're going to take the graph back to the bottom of the ice sheet, down to bedrock, and we're going to look at the uh, signature of climatic changes that have occurred throughout the couple hundred thousand years of the existence of the Greenland ice sheets. And the story that it tells is going to be is pretty dramatic, and to me raises profound questions about global change. And here we go. We'll just take a look at this now. That's a that's an entirely different looking scene. Entirely different looking scene, isn't it? Now that now there's still this um oscillation in uh, yeah. temperature and the relative oxygen isotope ratios, but there's the the, the amplitude is far different. Uh, yeah, it's like an order of magnitude different. Hmm. A different You're world, looking right? At change I mean, it's, it's like a me? different world that you're looking at. It's, a diff it's like a different world you're looking at. 
If you want to talk about global warming, look at this thing right here. You know, what the hell happened there? Well, what's going on? I mean, when you look at the, the, the amplitude of climatic change during the Holocene compared to the types of the, the degrees and uh, magnitude of climate change throughout the Pleistocene, or at least the last quarter million years, we're seeing something very different. Now, that's not to scale. I mean, you see the top half of that is the last 10,000 years, and then uh, you're jumping by tens of thousands of years. Because what's happening is you go down core, the bottom layers become compressed, right? So as you're coming up from the bedrock up to the top, you know, that the weight of the overlying ice is compressing. So the I think the what we're re really looking at here is, is these huge climatic jumps are showing up. But what's not showing up is you have to almost picture like this is like an accordion being collapsed. So within this, there are going to be warm intervals, but we're not seeing those. What we're seeing is these gigantic shifts in global temperature. These are, these are represent gigantic shifts in the oxygen isotope ratios, which is a proxy for what's going on in the environment around it. So you can see here, right here, this, this is, notice something here. Now you, you'll see it in this graph. You'll see that we're in the full depths right here. You see this glacial maximum. We're in the glacial maximum. And you see that it starts warming. Now, right here, you have this whole episode. Here's this first warming spike, uh, which was a severe warming spike. And then it plunged back into full glacial cold. And then there was a the second warming spike. But if you take these events out, the Balling, Alarod, and Younger Dryas, you can almost begin to see that there's this trend. Can you see, you take that out and you've got this coming up out of the Ice Age. Now, that is almost certainly going to be the result of the, the, the changes in orbital geometry that affect the amount of thermal energy being delivered to the surface of the Earth. So you've got the precessional cycle, you've got the uh, uh, obliquity of the ecliptic, and you've got the ellipse, the geometry of the ellipse. So there are times when the Earth is tilted a little more towards the sun. Sometimes it's tilted a little more because the obliquity of the ecliptic is not frozen. It shifts by a couple of degrees. Well, if it's the northern hemisphere is tilted towards the sun at one of its steeper angles of about closer to 24 point something degrees as, as compared to 23 and a half degrees, and it's in the uh, in the phase of the elliptical shape of the orbit where it's a little closer, you're going to have warming of the northern hemisphere. These are called the Milankovitch forces, and they are gradual, and they, they're certainly real, and they do affect change over long periods of time. Are they predictable? Or are they there? They're predictable, except what happens is now we're realizing that the climate of the planet's not behaving the way it's supposed to. In fact, um, some of the, the younger dryas actually happened when the planet should have been warming. See, that's what I'm saying. If we take this out of here, what we're going to have seen was a steady rise in temperature from, oh, you know, this is about seventeen or 18,000 years ago up to, um, you know, about 10,000 years ago. So if we take this oscillation out, I think then what we would be seeing was these Milankovitch warming, right? The slow gradual. Problem is, though, see, juxtaposed upon these slow warmings are these huge spikes of change. Which raises the questions, what, what are the causes of dramatic or, you know, you could say catastrophic peaks? Yes, yes. And here I'm showing this is, I've kind of zoomed in on that shift. You can really see. The trend is warming, but it's interrupted. Like right here, there's two extreme global warming events. Here's the first one, and then here's the second one. And it's almost like it took a couple of attempts to get the planet out of the grip of the Ice Age right here. The first one didn't work. For whatever the reason, there was this major spike of warming, and then the planet plunged back in. This is the Younger Dryas right here is that plunge back into full glacial cold that happened literally almost overnight. Um, so here we see Balling Alarod 14,600 years ago, 
and then the Younger Dryas pre-boreal. The Younger Dryas ended at 11,600 years ago, which which I never uh, get tired of pointing out was uh, Plato. If you read Plato in his accounts of Atlantis, he puts the uh, the destruction of Atlantis right there, right there at 11,600 years ago, 9,000 years before Solon's journey to Egypt, which occurred in 600 BC, roughly. And so you do the math and you come up with 11,600. And so we know that there was a major spike in sea level rise. I think that's the next graph. Yes, here we go. So this was when the first evidence of these Greenland ice cores began to get public. Here was this appeared in the, the science journal Nature in April of 1993. For measurements of annual ice layer thickness over the past 15,000 years, the authors find that Greenland's climate emerging from the last ice age twice shifted from glacial to interglacial conditions over an astonishingly quick three to five years. Think about it. from glacial full from glacial to interglacial conditions. We're talking about 10 to 12 degrees centigrade, which is like 18 degrees Fahrenheit in three to five years. Yeah, something we've never seen. No, we no no absolutely nothing we've like never anything seen we've that. ever seen. No, nothing even remotely close what, to what that. What kind of cars so, were they driving? <laughs> that's why. Right. Well, I think serious. they were all riding huh. their. I think they were all riding their mastodons and mammoths, and they were probably, um, hmm. you know, uh, emitting large <laughs> quantities of methane. At least that's one yeah. of the ideas. <laughs> I'm serious. That, that is uh, that's still an authentic. Um, uh, model yes. in some people's yeah. minds, huh? Yeah. So let's look at this. This is a graph of sea level rise at the end of last ice age. Now, based upon Milankovitch forces, this dashed line would be what one would expect, a, a, a relatively gradual rise over thousands of years of melting, reaching a peak, and then slowly, you know, dissipating down. And, and so this transfer, this, this, rise in sea level. This is the water that's being um, recaptured from the glaciers because the glaciers are melting. Six million roughly cubic miles of glacial ice mantling the continents, mostly North America and Northwestern Europe, right? And of course, that six million cubic miles of ice was water that was extracted from the oceans and locked up in the land. And then until the, the warming came along, melted that ice, introduced, introduced it back into the oceans, causing ocean levels to rise about 400 feet. So if we take that 6 million cubic miles of glacial ice, melt it all, or it, when we have that much ice um, accumulated on the continent, ocean levels are going to be about 400 feet lower. And I think the lowest that, we've, that they've documented in previous glaciations is sea level has been as much as 450 and 500 feet lower. And, than it and is certain now. land masses or islands simply cease to exist, at least above water. Yes, that's exactly right. So what we see in this graph is interesting because you see MWP-1B, MWP-1A, that's meltwater pulse. So the reintroduction of the meltwater into the oceans wasn't this smooth curve. It was these two massive pulses of meltwater. Um, and one of them, basically, here you go. And, and the dating range back when this, uh, this study was published, um, the dating range ranged between, this was the range of the meltwater pulse 1A dating, and you'll see that it goes back and really starts right at about 14,500 and then uh, the later date of it, you come down and it starts right at about 13,000, which would be the onset of the Younger Dryas. Then there was a second meltwater pulse that coincides with the end of the Younger Dryas. And they coincide with this right here. So here's meltwater pulse 1A and here's meltwater pulse 1B. So then the question is, is what's driving this? Which, what's driving Which then this? leads to models of you know, yes. hypotheses. And yeah. So, so what's in your view, and, and I've heard you talk about this before, but the most substantiated model that explains those uh, catastrophic changes? Well, I, it's my impression that the most plausible model is, you know, 
cosmic impacts. Um, and I actually believe, and I think that there's considerable amount of evidence to support the idea that there was a bombardment epoch at the end of the last ice age. And we may have had several episodes of, of, uh, serious environmental and climatic disruption occurring because of, uh, cosmic impacts. Uh, let's see here. I think I've got another graph. Let's see. It should be, no, it's not in this program, but that shows, uh, it's a mortality graph showing the loss of, of species. And I'm going to read something to you here. This is from a, uh, a recent paper that just came out in, with respect to the, um, the younger Dryas. It was, um, yeah, just this year, 2022. Um, James Lawrence Powell, he's with the University of Southern California, and he talks here about um, the resistance to the Younger Dryas Impact idea. And he says, the progress of science has sometimes been unjustifiably delayed by the premature rejection of a hypothesis for which substantial evidence existed and which later achieved consensus. And he mentions continental drift and meteorite impact cratering. cratering. Um, and then he says, this article presents evidence that the Younger Dryas impact hypothesis is a 21st century case of unjustified resistance to an idea that actually has a considerable amount of actual hard scientific uh, data that supports it. I just heard, um, w w last time I was with you, I heard George Howard give uh, an excellent presentation from Cosmic Tusk. He gave an excellent presentation about forensic evidence for the impact hypothesis. So I think, I, I don't know if that exists elsewhere online, uh, but he did it. It probably does. Uh, yeah. Uh, George's work is great that he does over Cosmic Tusk. You met him, right? Yeah. 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 Because he was there at the Sedona event. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Great guy. Um a lot of fun to get out in the field with. So then what he does is he goes to, um, he, <clears throat> he uh, catalogs what he refers to as six major events that occurred at or soon after the onset of the Younger Dryas. Uh, for reference, he gives the Younger Dryas began at 12.85 thousand years ago, or in round numbers, 12,900. Um, <clears throat> he talks about, number one, Glacial Lake Agassiz was the largest of the proglacial lakes that formed across Upper North America's glacial ice dammed streams and lake outlets. It covered several Canadian provinces and parts of the northern U.S. and was larger than the present Great Lakes combined. In glacial times, this vast body of water drained south down the Mississippi River and into the Gulf of Mexico. Then, as the Laurentide ice melted and retreated northward, the ice dams that had blocked the flow of water from Lake Agassiz failed catastrophically and new outlet channels opened, allowing the water to spill eastward through the St. Lawrence system into the North Atlantic and northward down the Mackenzie River into the Arctic Ocean. This quote-unquote great plumbing shift, as geologists have nicknamed it, took place exactly at the onset of the Younger Dryas. Um, and then the second point here is Merton et al. and Kegwin et al. dated the age of the Mackenzie River flood and thus the onset of the collapse of Lake Agassiz to shortly after 13,000 years ago at or near the beginning of the Younger Dryas. Uh, another great ice sheet comparable to the Laurentide covered Finland, Norway, Sweden, and parts of Russia. As it retreated northward, the first catastrophic outburst flood from Baltic Ice Lake, a freshwater body that, like Lake Agassiz formed from glacial meltwater, occurred at the Younger Dryas onset of 12.85 thousand years ago, or 12,850 years ago. Then, fourth, the margins of the Greenland ice, she ice shelf began to destabilize at the beginning of the Younger Dryas. Considering all of these events, Douglas Kennett noted that it is difficult to explain the triggering of such widespread synchronous changes at the margins of three relatively isolated northern hemisphere ice sheets, the Laurentide, the Feniscandian, and Greenland, and their related proglacial lakes by invoking conventional climatic 
and or paleo-oceanographic paleo processes. Instead, this broad range of evidence is more readily explained by catastrophic processes triggered by a cosmic impact with Earth, the Younger Dryas Boundary Cosmic Impact Theory. And then the fifth point that he makes is that in North and South America, about three-fourths of megafaunal mammal genera became extinct at or near the onset of the Younger Dryas. Over the decades, anthropologists have debated rival theories to explain the extinctions. One, the slaughter of naive animals by newly arrived hunters. This is the overkill hypothesis. Or two, the climatic change that marked the arrival of the Younger Dryas. However, extinctions of such a scale are not known to have occurred in association with other abrupt temperature oscillations of the Pleistocene. To illustrate how anomalous were the Younger Dryas extinctions, consider the horse. In the Western Hemisphere, horses and their ancestors had survived as an unbroken evolutionary lineage for approximately 56 million years, since the beginning of the Eocene. Yet, abruptly, at or near the onset of the Younger Dryas, every horse species outside of Eurasia became extinct. As evidence that the onset of the Younger Dryas, and at least some of the extinctions, were virtually simultaneous, at some sites, the so-named Black Mat, to be discussed later, and which is synchronous with the onset of the Younger Dryas, drapes over the bones of animals whose remains are never found in Younger Strata. And then, final point, at the onset of the Younger Dryas, the beautiful, fluted projectile points of Clovis disappear from the archaeological record. They have never been found in situ or in situ above, um, above the Younger Dryas boundary. Anderson et al. present evidence that the population of Clovis also underwent a major decline. The people themselves did not disappear, but likely transitioned from a continent-wide culture to dispersed regional societies. Now, I find that term dispersed regional societies rather interesting because it's a very non-emotive way of saying, well, you had a continent-wide culture that disappeared and what you had in the aftermath was just pockets of survivors. Yeah, how does the overkill hypothesis explain the... Uh near disappearance of uh, the Clovis people. Well, no, it doesn't. And, right. see, and see, to me, that's sort of the death knell for the overkill. Because for one thing, you're showing that the human population suffered dramatic declines in, in numbers along with the animals. So when, you know, when it's presumed that, you know, these humans are sweeping across the Bering Land Bridge and decimating over a hundred mega mammal species from Alaska to Tierra del Fuego in less than a millennium, you got to wonder, geez, these guys, you know, and if you go and you start looking up and doing a little bit of research onto, you know, what was the population, what was the human population of the world during the latter phases of the ice age, you come up with um, estimates of five to 10 million people worldwide. That's not very there many. There's some hungry dudes. Some hungry dudes. Yeah. But somehow, and then, okay, and then you go and you do a little studies from the paleontologist, estimates of how many mammoths were there in the world? Well, 10 to 12 million individual animals. So, wait a minute, you're saying that if, you know, 5 to 10 million people, and, and of those, of course, that's people. That includes, you know, women and children as well. How many, and elderly people, so of that 10 million, how many of those are actually hunting? Half of them? you know, maybe half of them, and somehow they're able to wipe out. So that's, you know, you have to, and it has to be so quick that the animals can't reproduce. So, I mean, it's like you're having to, you know, every hunter is having to take down a couple of woolly mammoths, I think, every year. And then, you know, you figure if they're eating woolly mammoth steaks, I mean, how many how many burgers can you get out of a six-ton mammoth? Right. And why would you keep killing the uh, giant armadillo that's running around as well, as George Howard pointed out uh, in his presentation yeah. the other day? No one wants to eat well, the small armadillo today. 
<laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. But, you know, here's the thing. We also know as hunter-gatherers, they were hunting small game. They were fishing. They were gathering plants and food. So, I mean, they had a very diversified diet. They weren't like exclusively eating mega mammal flesh, you know. And again, why, why, when you look at the species that went extinct, you know, you had, most people don't eat, you know, you think elephants. Well, then you think Africa primarily, you think Serengeti Plain, you think of Kenya, um, you think of India, you know, there's two species of elephants in the world today. Well, America, you know, an elephant is a proboscidean, long nose, right? Well, during the Ice Age, North America had four species of proboscideans. You know, you had the, 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 the woolly mammoth, you had the Colombian mammoth, you had mammoth, the imperial mammoth, you had mastodons, right? They're all gone. Were they all hunted to extinction by loincloth-wearing, Birkenstad-clad hunters? You know, with their, despite of the fact that, that, that the Clovis spear points are, are like, said very elegant very beautiful and extremely sharp it's still you know to to bring down a mammoth you're talking about probably one of the most dangerous animals that you're trying to hunt and we know they did hunt because we've found we've found mammoth remains at blackwater draw at murray springs at other places where um like at blackwater draw there was a mammoth skeleton found with a spear point embedded in the rib, rib cage so, but it's a huge extrapolation to go from that to the overkill hypothesis. Well, we find a couple of mammoths that was, with uh, spear points embedded in their remains. So therefore, humans wiped out every single mammoth on the planet. Yeah. So, so what do you say to the skeptic then that says, well, terrible things could happen, maybe even generated by impactors from space uh, over 10,000 years ago or during the Younger Dryas or that ended the Younger Dryas. Uh, but it's unlikely that kind of thing would ever happen again. I mean, there, have we had, talk to us about, again, there's a, there's a periodicity to a lot of things. Uh, perhaps if that's some cosmic principle that there's some regularity or uh, cycles of these kinds of events. I mean, do we see any evidence of that even in um, recorded human history? And maybe talk about some of your cataloging of uh, near-Earth events, asteroids, objects, um, I mean, there's a whole many, uh, th there's a whole list of things that maybe are worth touching upon that I don't know that we'd have time to get into everything, but I think of the Tunguska event that you've talked about before in the past, that's worth talking about, um, annually, uh, or semi-annually, we've got, uh, a great show of, uh, falling stars that come into our atmosphere. Usually they never, they're not impactors, but, um, you know, what is it that causes those things and what evidence do we have that we're vulner vulnerable today or that our space well, think, <laughs> architecture is vulnerable today out in it, uh, in our orbits? It brings us back to the, the issues we started, you know, the idea of what's below our feet and what's above our heads. And we could go through this real quick. I did this on uh, my last appearance on Joe Rogan. Uh, I hope it made a big an impression on him, but I'm just going to speed through this. I think this goes back to 1998 is when I really started uh, keeping track of this in detail. But as you will see here, now none of these, of course, presented any immediate danger to the planet. But what, what these things are, are showing us is that astronomers are seeing that the heavens, uh, that our cosmic neighborhood is a whole lot more active than anybody was visualizing or imagined 50 years ago. Uh, you know, a couple of generations ago, before we had um, the ability to monitor things, there, you know, things could fly by us in the night and we'd never know it. But now with our technology, with our telescopes and, and, and the instrumentation that we have, we're detecting things. And so I'm just going to speed through this because I think this, what this is showing us is that you know, yeah, there's a whole lot going on out there over our heads in our celestial neighborhood, and it's not really getting the kinds of attention it that that it warrants. So let's just go through some of the, you're seeing this, right? We Earth just dodges yeah. big asteroid. Uh -huh. Yeah. So uh, like it says, in cosmic terms, it was a close call. A large asteroid capable of wreaking widespread damage in a collision with Earth passed within half a million miles last month. The closest approach of such an object in 50 years, astronomers said Wednesday. Well, we'll just go through some of this here. Um, 
Gi- and this is a, this is later the next year. Giant asteroid makes close pass by Earth, a mile wide chunk of space rock. Then uh, it was a close call for planet Earth. This was another one event, May eighteenth, nineteen ninety six. Um, then it's new study that, uh, came out in 2000 study raises number of dangerous asteroids. A new study estimates 900 large asteroids cruise orbital superhighways where they someday might strike earth causing widespread death and destruction. Yet so far, astronomers have found only 40% of the big space rocks each at least 0.6 miles in diameter. Now 0.6 is an interesting, uh, threshold because that's the point at which an impact would have global consequences. Um, Asteroid estimates too low. Nine objects have come close to the Earth since 1991. Current predictions for the number of potentially dangerous asteroids have been underestimated by at least 20 percent. According to recent calculations, there are between 750 and 900 asteroids circling the Earth with the potential to cause devastation on impact. Now, these are big events you're, you're pointing out here, let alone yes. the uh, many thousands or many more thousands of smaller, inconsequential impactors yes. that uh, are pelting the Earth or the atmosphere annually. Right. Now, this is interesting because a, a researcher at the U.S.-based Massachusetts Institute for Technology says these predictions should be revised upwards based on new data. Um, then December 2000, asteroid makes close approach. This one was 150 feet. Now, that's about the size of the object that detonated over Tunguska in 1908, which we definitely should talk about because there are so many lessons to be derived from that event in 1908 that have direct relevance for us to understand what the current situation is with respect to potential impacts. Well, if if you don't mind mentioning here, I mean, I've, what what was the uh compare that to like the nuclear bombs that we drop in Japan oh i well, mean i mean see. what what kind of explosive impact did the tunguska event have and and how far up did it explode cuz it okay, never so, it doesn't impact the earth so the tunguska event was estimated based upon the surface damage which was over 800 square miles of old growth taiga forest that was utterly destroyed. Uh, the radius of destruction would be a qu- roughly equivalent to the detonation of a 15 megaton nuclear warhead, which is about, I think, the largest ever tested in the, uh, at the peak of the Cold War by the U.S. was, uh, maybe it was Mike, I, uh, 20 megatons. The largest warheads we deployed were like 15 megatons, and that was back in the early days of nuclear uh strategy which was mutual assured destruction because the idea was that you got a 15 megaton bomb well you don't have to have pinpoint accuracy you know mutual assured destruction was based on the idea that if you attack us we can wipe wipe you off the face of the earth we can destroy all your cities you know one 15 megaton hydrogen bomb will completely destroy most any urban area of, of large city on the planet. And so Tunguska was about the equivalent of a 15 megaton hydrogen bomb. And our, and our nuclear bombs that we dropped, those were, those were atom bombs in the kiloton range. In the kiloton at range. At the end so, of World War II. So Tunguska was between 1,000 and 1,500 times more powerful than the uh, fat man and little boy that destroyed Hiroshima and Nagasaki. 1,000 to 1,500 times more powerful. Um, so that was, uh, it was a big deal. If it had happened, uh, over a, a populated area, I think, uh, the history of the 20th century would have been quite a bit different than it was. But as it was, the, the detonation occurred over Northern Siberia in a very, uh, low populated area. There's, it's not known that if anybody was killed directly, several people died later from injuries, but, um, yeah, so it, it, like I said, we should devote some time to that. We could circle back and we'll do another episode and we can get in there and we can start extracting some of those lessons that I think that uh, that event taught us. But as we go through, we'll just scientists worry over asteroids, May 2001, 
A group of scientists is seeking a standardized protocol for dealing with the possibility of an asteroid or comet striking the Earth, saying humans can do more than the dinosaurs ever could before a colossal impact precipitated their extinction 65 million years ago. Um, huge asteroid narrowly misses the Earth in 2002. In intergalactic terms, it was a close shave. An asteroid capable of causing widespread destruction narrowly missed the Earth on Monday. Um, it was about 300 meters or almost 1,000 feet in diameter. So you can figure Tunguska was about 150 feet in diameter. And if the volume of a sphere increases by um, the cube of the radius. So if you take, it's roughly four-thirds times the cube of the radius. And so if we did that, we would see that an object, uh, say a thousand feet in diameter would have a 500 foot, uh, a 500 foot radius. And if we go four divided by three gives us 1.3 times, um, why did the X, uh, three. So yes, that's going to be much, much bigger, much, much larger in size than Tunguska. And so it's going to be proportionately more devastating. An object a thousand feet in diameter, you think of it this way, Tunguska is a, is a city killer. It could, it could wipe out an urban area. Uh, an object a thousand feet in diameter, you could think of that as it could wipe out an entire state, a mid-sized state, let's say the size of Georgia or Pennsylvania or, or, or Washington state would completely devastate a, a, a state of that size. But it would also have global uh, climatic repercussions, similar to what you would expect from a, a very large volcanic eruption. Like happened in the early, was it the early 19th century? There was a, it was halfway around the world, but it impacted agriculture Tambor. and, and farming yes. uh, practices for a number of years in the years to follow. Yes, yes, this year without a summer, 1816. That was the eruption of Tambora. And uh, that has been referred to as the last great subsistence crisis of Western civilization. We could go on here. Let's keep going here. Uh, large asteroid passes close to Earth, and then asteroid buzzes Earth, highlighting cosmic blind spot. An asteroid large enough to have flattened a city buzzed Earth earlier this month and was not seen until after it flew harmlessly by. The space rock approached Earth in the glare of the sun, a blind spot that made it impossible to see during the day or night from any terrestrial vantage point. The event illustrates the potential of a surprise hit by an asteroid, astronomers say. Uh, it was probably between 40 and 80 meters in diameter, or 130 to 260 feet. So again, that would put it in the size range of Tunguska or larger. Um, keep going here too close for, and this is, see, this is, uh, this, yeah, this is the same one in June, too close for comfort asteroid passed within 70,000, 75,000 miles of earth. That's, that's a very close shave. Yeah. We've got, um, well, so the moon is what a quarter million miles from here, roughly speaking, depending on where it's at in its orbit. Yes. And, uh, we've got space assets in uh, low earth orbit and medium earth orbit and on out to geosynchronous orbit, geosynchronous yes. orbits out in, you know, half that distance. Yes. And, and we we do our space-based missile warning from the 30,000, roughly speaking, you know, yep. kilometer or, uh, or just under that in miles. Um, so, and we even have some highly elliptical orbit, uh, mm -hmm. space satellites that go out far beyond that. And so we're really getting into that territory there that you mentioned. Yeah, and what that does is it it really expands the radius of potential uh, effects of a close encounter. Let's see here, March of two thousand two. And you're still back in two thousand two. I mean, we, we've got a lot of articles you've been collecting since then. Yeah, asteroid two thousand and two M N gives Earth its closest shave in years. Uh, let's. Get past this. Okay, then in August of 2002, there's another near miss. This is an 800 meter wide asteroid. So an 800 meter wide asteroid, um, that's 800 times 3.28. So that's going to be, um, wow, 2,624. That's a half. That's a half a mile in diameter. Now we're looking at global consequences. 
you know, an 800 meter asteroid hitting anywhere in North America would cause severe disruption of the entire continent. And it would uh, undoubtedly would have, um, yeah, and this is only 530,000 kilometers, slightly farther away than the moon, but still a near miss by ast astronomers' standards. And here's the thing what we've learned from the uh, 1994 uh, impact into Jupiter of Shoemaker Levy 9 is that these objects can actually get captured into orbits. If they come close enough, they can be captured into an orbit that will eventually lead to them impacting the primary object. They will get captured into an orbit. They will, they will um, function as a satellite for a while, and then they will eventually impact the, the primary object. Um, closest asteroid yet flies past Earth, October 2003. Mm, that's a close one. That's a close one. Well, how big was that one? It was a small one, about 75 or 80 feet in diameter. Which, I mean, you get thinking about it, though, if that hits a city or above a city. Oh, yeah. Well, That's remember, a big Chal yeah, remember Chelyabinsk over Siberia. This was, this a few one years would have ago. been, yeah, this would have been slightly larger than that. Um, and, you know, even the Chelyabinsk event, uh, uh, it could have come in, let's say it came in, it was slightly bigger or came in at a slightly steeper angle. Instead of detonating, you know, eight miles up or 12 miles up, it could have come much closer to the earth the surface and therefore its radius of destruction would have you know in involved it, rather than you know 1500 people injured it could have been 1500 people killed um earth almost put on impact alert Im astronomers have revealed how they came within minutes of alerting the world to a potential asteroid strike last month some scientists believed on the 13th of January, a 30-meter object, later designated 2004 AS1, had a 1 in 4 chance of hitting the planet within 36 hours. Now, that's 30 meters, that's a little over 100 feet, so that's putting it up in the city killer range. That's getting in the range of the Tunguska object. Um, uh, March 2004, asteroid soars past Earth oh so closely. Um, asteroid 2004 MN4 was a really near miss. It doesn't say there, uh, oh, there. It doesn't say how far away it was. Well, it's in one of these, it, it does say, I'll have to circle back here. Uh, yes, now this is a good one. At midnight Greenwich Mean Time on August 10th, 1998, ML-14 crossed the orbit of the Earth at the exact point that the latter had occupied 18 hours earlier. It had ML-14 reached that point at 6 a.m. the previous morning, an area the size of France would have been totally devastated by 6.05. Most of the world's vegetation would have been in flames by 8 o'clock, and 30 to 40 percent of the human race would have been dead or dying by late October. Now, this should be a sobering wake-up call, you know, that we really are part of a cosmic ecosystem um, that has played a profound role in the history of this planet, and as I suggested in our first episode together, was in civilization as well. Okay, don't, don't pass up on this uh, later on. I want to make sure we circle back to some idea, but I've, I've asked it a couple of times, and I want you to keep going through this to make this point, but... Is it always just random chance, or are there periods uh, throughout, you know, epochs of history in which there's a potentially greater concentration of debris or matter or rocks that uh, the Earth and our solar system is passing through that should give us concern? Um, you, you know, and are we approaching one of those, or did we pass through one of those um, uh, 12,000 years ago in the Younger Dryas era? And so whether you talk about that now or later, I'm really interested in trying to peel that back a little bit if we can and see if there's some way that once, because I think if we get people who are in this business, whether they're in the Space Force and do military work or in the, the, the government civil side of things at NASA or elsewhere, I know there are people that care about this kind of thing, usually not in the military, unfortunately. But if we can start to cage our minds on some of these ideas, then maybe we start to think about this in ways that 
can be useful in the years ahead rather than it's just this uh, this fleeting phenomenon we were exposed to that's a part of history but not necessarily a part of our imminent future. I think that a couple of things we could comment there. I think that, yes, uh, I think clearly what, what the, the record shows, the geological, paleontological, archaeological record shows is that there are these repeated interruptions within the continuum of change. And the, you know, the most, in my mind, the most likely uh, trigger for these interruptions is cosmic um, impact. But it's also, you know, I use the term exogenic, which means from outside. So that the, the primary trigger for these is exogenic in origin. But I think there's also can be a very powerful endogenic response. So that we mentioned this in our first conversation that, that impacts, you know, may also trigger uh, extended episodes of volcanism. Um, they may be responsible for, and this goes back to the work of uh, Fred Hoyle and Chandra Wickramasinghe, who theorized really even back in the 70s and 80s that it might have been impact type events responsible for bringing the uh, for the onset of an ice age and the global cooling and then that that idea was picked up by Klube, Napier, Asher and those guys of the British Neocatastrophist school who came to believe that you know they used the term cosmic winter and it was interesting that back in the early 80s you of course have heard the term nuclear winter that was when it was realized by scientists that there would be very crossover type of similarities between an all-out nuclear war and a cosmic impact. With the difference being nuclear war, you're going to have the radiation component, which you're not going to have. However, we know from Tunguska that, you know, the, uh, the ozone layer can be dramatically depleted in an impact, which would then allow more uh, cosmic radiation to reach the surface of the Earth. It's usually being buffered by the ozone. So there could be that whole level of consequences also to a cosmic impact event. But there's the similarities, the fire, the dust injected into the atmosphere that increases the opacity of the atmosphere and the reflectivity of it so that thermal energy coming in from the sun is reflected back to space, calling a, causing a cooling on the surface, and that this could lead to these might be what's triggering some of these rapid climate changes. And now with the advent of the Younger Dryas, it really does look like we can see the onset of a cosmic winter coinciding precisely with an, uh, which I believe to be a series of impacts. I don't think we can explain the Younger Dryas events by a single impact. But we know now that those things are feasible. We, we witnessed it for ourselves in 1994 with the, the multiple 21 impacts on uh, the Jovian surface within one year. I mean, within within one week of July 1994. And I think that that was another important cosmic lesson. I kind of looked that there's a number of these things that have taught us things that are really critical for us to understand the nature of this larger environment in which we find ourselves. And we have to start thinking in those terms, that we are part of a cosmic ecosystem. Yeah, that's a great way of putting it. Uh, Jupiter in that cosmic ecosystem acts as a giant shield or guardian of our planet. It does most of the time, but sometimes mm. it'll be just the opposite. Instead of capturing the the comets coming in, flinging and, them into new orbits. Instead. Yes, it'll it'll actually <laughs> throw them down towards the sun where they. And this is probably what happened. We're going to get into when after we talk about Tunguska. You know, Tunguska uh, occurred uh, early in the morning of June thirtieth, nineteen oh eight. Now which is interesting because that's precisely the peak of the torrid meteor shower, right? And there's a whole history uh, going back uh, that involves the torrid meteor shower. And, you know, one of the things about Tunguska that that, that uh, made it so destructive in its, in its way was that it didn't, it, it, it was not, I mean, how can I put it? Well, nobody knew it was coming until it was there. And the reason is, is, you know, it had just passed perihelion, which is its close passage to the sun. And so if you look at the torrid meteor stream, and we'll, we'll, I have graphics and things we can pull up for our next episode to, to really get down to the details of the torrid meteor stream. But basically, the Earth crosses the torrid meteor stream twice each year. Um, it, it comes uh, in its post-perihelion passage in late June, early July which means it's crossing the stream after the material has circled the sun and is now coming from the direction of the sun. 
in late October, early November, uh, which has led the uh, torrid meteor stream to be sometimes referred to as the Halloween meteors. It's just the opposite. The material we're crossing the stream as it's coming in from, uh, you know, from its outer aphelion position, which means it's furthest position from the sun. So during late October, early November, if you were going to go out at night, the Taurid meteor stream takes its name from the constellation Taurus. And the radiant point, the point in space where these meteors appear to be emanating, is almost bullseyed on the Pleiades, the shoulder of the bull. So if you go out around Halloween, you look towards, find the constellation of Taurus in the sky, and you look towards the, the star cluster, the Pleiades, you will see meteors every few minutes or so. You'll see a meteor coming, and if you trace its trajectory back, it'll zero in on that radiant point. As if right? they're coming from. As the, if. As They're if. not really right. coming from. But from our vantage. From our that's vantage. That's their emanation point. Yes, and and the graphics I sh will show you in the yeah. in a upcoming uh, conversation will make that clear to everybody how that works. Okay, but so you're looking in the in the fall meteors toward meteor stream. You're looking away from the sun, so you can actually see the meteors approaching. The summertime they're they they're coming from the direction of the sun, and this is exactly what um, happened with Tunguska, and. The radiant point, the point in space from which Tunguska most likely emanated, fits perfectly with where a torrid meteor would have would have come from, the direction it would have come from. So you had you had the the location in space from whence the meteor came, and you had the time of year, which to me is pretty it's it's circumstantial, but it's 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 pretty clear yeah. that the most likely explanation is that it was a member of this particular meteor swarm. And and that will be a, a very important topic of conversation because what that brings us back to is this idea that the that it and it's related to a whole family of of meteors and asteroids and cometary um what appear to have been remnant cometary nuclei. Um so we'll 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 look at that in detail because I think it's really really important stuff. But there's there's a lot of matter still in that meteor stream, and we do cross that meteor stream twice each year. And if we wanted to talk about periods of uh, heightened vulnerability, that would be a good example. Okay, and that's right, an right. annual or semi-annual occurrence. That's right. And there that's could right. potentially though be, you know, you've got as I've talked to others about these um motions of the earth that you describe uh in that that first set of videos that i mentioned in this last episode uh, i think it was called the great year i uh i consider the diurnal motion this idea that the earth is rotating about its own axis and every 24 hours it brings about repeatable predictable um set of occurrences or circumstances you know the sun is going to rise in the east you know it will set you know there's daytime you know there's nighttime and we're we're subjected to that as humans whether we pay any attention to it or not but it's a part of our daily uh, uh our daily lives um whether we want it there or not and the same is true for our our annual path around the sun you've got seasons that are repeatable predictable every journey around the sun that we make and then again, I'm bringing this back up because I have great interest in this. I don't know if you're are you are you reluctant to get into maybe the great year cycle at this point? But but, but I'm I'm interested. Not at in, all. Not because at all. I... We're used to thinking about Earth's rotation about its axis. We're used to thinking about an annual cycle. You know, every every time someone has a birthday, a friend of mine says, "Hey, you've gone around the sun one more time." And as every time I see it, even though I'm somewhat space minded, I think. Yeah, that is what that means, isn't it? Because we don't tend to think about these motions. But there is a greater motion that's um, imperceptible to us in a, in a single lifetime because that processional wobble of the Earth, so to speak, uh, I think it's roughly a, a degree every 72 years. So in a, in a human lifetime, you've got an imperceptible change in the Earth's uh, ax axial position. And so in my entire lifetime, I'll go out and look at Polaris, and I'll see that Polaris is there, and it's a fixed point as a nail in a sure place. 
about which all these fixed stars are circumambulating in a way. But in the grand scheme of things, we're looking at geological time frames in which climates are fluctuating, for example. But we're talking now about impactors from space. There's a semi-annual, predictable, repeatable cycle that occurs in June and maybe, I think, October uh, every year. Is there some grander, um, repeatable, predictable cycle that we are participants in in this grand cosmic ecology that we've either forgotten about or completely ignore um, and and how so how is what you've studied and looked at um, how does it shed light on maybe that grander picture that grand repeatable predictable cycle um, I think of well I should probably stop there at the risk of talking too much but <laughs> you, you, probably you know should. <laughs> well, you're, what you're doing you know, is, is you're is, setting really me up for in a for, and it's very interesting absolutely it is and it brings us back to this idea of are there bombardment epochs and i think that bombardment epochs yeah okay yeah yeah that's, that's the phrase that's the phrase right and so i think the answer is a qualified yes i think that um that there is periodicity and it may Why is have it qualified well qualified because it's i couldn't prove it okay but i think that there's a cir circumstantial case to be made that's a um, safe way of putting it i think yeah I'm, i i try to be play it safe whenever possible, but it's not always possible. So, um, but, um, we will definitely get into this at some point and we can get into this whole structure of this system, but we've got, um, I think it's probably what you have is that, you know, the, the outer solar system is occupied by hundreds of millions of comets, the Kuiper disc, which then phases into the Oort cloud. And I think what we need to be really, in terms of trying to determine whether there's a periodicity to, um, let's say, catastrophic change on Earth, I think this is where we should be looking. Is there something that could uh, affect the delivery of deep space comets and objects uh, into a near-Earth orbit? And I think the answer is yes, there is. There's actually several mechanisms by which a uh, sort of a, a, a bucket brigade could be established that will feed. You mentioned earlier about the, the role of Jupiter in capturing a lot of this stuff and, and slinging it back out to the outer solar system. And then I pointed out, but not always. You can understand why these ancient mythologies uh, point to these great planets as mm -hmm. gods. Mm -hmm. Right, I mean Jupiter, the great protector or god or king. Well, I mean the image of Jupiter hurling his thunderbolts, you know, right there. I mean, it's right. This gets us back into this idea again that we have to, I think, um, reconsider what some of the ancient peoples really knew and and what their scientific understanding of of the world was, um, and and the way that they preserved their traditions and their information and their knowledge was through the medium of myth. That's how they did it. They, myth is just a collection of symbols, just like modern science is a collection of symbols. And when you learn to read the symbolic language, you can understand the physics or the chemistry or whatever the subject is. And mythology is a set of, of symbols. That that's, can a, be, that's a good way of looking at it. Yeah, well, it's like it, the English language or the English alphabet. It's absolutely. got a series of symbols that you need to learn to read in order to communicate something. That's right. That's right. So I, you know, I'm a great respecter of the knowledge and the insight and the understanding of nature that has been delivered to us via the medium of, of mythology. Um, and I think that, you know, that that's going to be an important, I, I think we, you know, modern science has lots of gaps. And I think mythology has the potential of filling some of those gaps in our understanding of the natural order of things in which we find ourselves existing. And likewise, you know, when you think about history too, you know, so much has been lost. You know, you think about the, the, the great library at Alexandria or the great library at Carthage, which were destroyed. Um, you know, you're looking at hundreds of thousands of volumes of what? I mean, it's like, my God, is there... My in my fantasy world somewhere there's another library of of Alexandria hidden away somewhere that we're going to discover, 
and there's going to be half a million volumes of ancient lore in there, and suddenly we're going to have a whole different dis- perspective on the deep history of our species on this planet. That a bunch of experts will set about arguing about and uh, disagreeing about their interpretations. and As they do now, yes. But I, I always like to point out that, you know, we're, we're pushing the uh, presence of modern humans, modern homo sapiens sapiens on this planet, but back to close to a couple of hundred thousand years. And how many generations is that? If we go 200,000 years and we allow 25 years for a generation, Oh, that's only 8,000 generations. So it's like, okay, well, if we look at our own history, how far have we come in the last five or six generations? I like to point out that when my grandparents were born in the latter part of the 19th century, the primary mode of transportation for most people around the world was foot, horseback, you know, donkeys, right? You know, that was the primary mode of transportation. Uh, and how far have we come since my grandparents were born? Yeah, just a few generations, right? Three three, and four generations later. Yes, yes. Now, imagine that we're looking back from 10 or 20,000, 30,000 years from now. Let's, let's assume that there's a catastrophe. Modern civilization collapses. And just like we talked, what was it, the, uh, the terminology for the, um, uh, for the uh, Clovis culture? Um, Oh, yes, dispersed regional societies. Well, let's say there's a global catastrophe. Well, that's a, that's a non-emotive way of talking about pockets of survivors struggling for existence to call them dispersed regional societies. So let's suppose we have global catastrophe. In the aftermath, we have dispersed regional societies. And then we're looking back 20,000 years from now, 10,000 years from now, how easy would it be for these few centuries of progress to just get lost in the noise? Very easy, you see. And then we have the other side of the spectrum, which is the, the ancient record, which suggests over and over again from all the cultures and lands of the planet that there was another order of things happening in the past. And it can, has many names, but... Yeah, it's it's implicit in so many of the, the the grand mythical traditions that have come down to us and religious traditions. Well, to that point, um, and it was because of I think a, a two part series you had done on Atlantis. Uh, I, I decided I want to read, uh, and I'd only listened to the first of, of of those, but I thought I need to go back and read Plato's Timaeus. And so you you don't have to read for very long. I mean, you spend an hour with that, and you start to see some really interesting things in the text. Uh, Is it um, is Solon? Is he the one that's mentioned in that text where he he ends up uh, in well, what we consider ancient Egypt, and and he's told there by the Egyptians, you you Greeks know nothing. Uh, You're just newbies. Yeah, and you come here to Egypt to learn how the world used to be because you know nothing about the ancient world, but we do, and so you come here to learn things. I mean, that's my way of putting it, but that's essentially what he's told when he goes there, and he comes back trying to bring understanding to the then Greek world. Right. We look at ancient Greece as like ancient. I I mean, it was a long time ago, but they were the the new kids on the block trying to aspire to something that had come before. Yes. And their understanding, which is an eye opener. I mean, for yeah. people, we don't appreciate that today. And and in that in that story of Timaeus, which is the first part of the of his, of his Atlantis narrative, followed by Critias, um, where he kind of describes the more sociological aspects of Atlantis and what brought about its demise, um, which is I think that there's some very interesting moral connotations to the whole story. But What I tried to show in my Atlantis thing is if you just go back and you strip away all the woo-woo and the New Age stuff and, you know, the stuff that's accreted onto the story and just go back to the bare bones of the story itself, it's not, from the geological perspective, it's not that implausible. Because, again, what's interesting is placing the demise of Atlantis, which occurs, according to Plato, as a result of an earthquake, which causes the island or islands to you know, subside beneath the ocean. And we know that there was a massive isostatic response along the mid-Atlantic Ridge due to the rapid sea level rise 
and Meltwater Pulse 1B, which was the second big Meltwater Pulse into primarily the North Atlantic, when did that happen? Precisely Plato's date. Now, it was that discovery really on my part, I think going back in the early 90s, that really go, hmm, this might, might warrant a closer look. And I had read stuff about Atlantis, but had kind of set it aside as being, well, who knows, you know. But circling back to it and, and coming back with a little bit more understanding of geophysics, I'm going through the details. I'm going, well, this is, this is not woo. This is, this is uh, certainly plausible. And his dating is perfect, you know. Now, what we have to do is we really the, the leap we have to make is that humans at 11,600 or 12,000 years ago were capable of navigation, they, that, that they had seafaring capabilities. To me, that is not a huge stretch because, for one thing, we know that islands within the Mediterranean were colonized and occupied 25 and 30,000 years ago. So somebody was able to at least navigate from the mainland to islands in the Mediterranean. As far as long ago as twenty five or thirty thousand years ago, is it such a huge stretch, pseudo scientific stretch, to assume that well maybe someone could sail from you know Western Iberia to the Azores Islands or some of those Mid Atlantic islands? No, I don't. To me, it's not. It's not such a huge stretch, and that's all we have to do is we have to go. Okay, well I'll make that one leap of faith, and if we assume that people had navigational skills um, 12,000 years ago, if there was some culture. Now, we're not talking about you know rocket ships and crystal laser technologies, none of that. What I would say we're talking about is perhaps uh, a counterpart to the Phoenician or the Minoan culture, more advanced, but, you know, in larger scale. But the, then when you look at um, the environment of the, ice age periods, like the, the latter part of the Pleistocene. And you go, well, if you were living back then, you know, where would be the one logical place where a culture possibly could thrive? And it turns out, and then, and then I think this is why you probably should go back, Matt, and watch part two. Because I show the, um, the, the uh, reconstructed, um, you know, um, ocean circulation and how it, uh, would have been very conducive to mid-Atlantic islands being really almost the ideal place to try to establish any kind of civilization during the Ice Age. You know, the, uh, the Gulf Stream uh, diverted south hundreds of miles. You, you called it a uh, leap of faith, you know, if you're willing to, uh, to allow for that leap of faith. I almost, you know, given when, when you start to look into this, it almost doesn't seem like a leap of faith or much of a leap of faith to someone like me. Uh, it almost seems common sense after a little while. Um, and, uh, I mean, there's plenty of silly things people are willing to believe in these days, I suppose all throughout human history, but that doesn't seem very silly. Well, it doesn't the idea to me. that they could be a seafaring people. Yes. Yes. And that was what I was, the point I was trying to make during that two-part Atlantis live stream, that let's look at the actual science here. And that's why I went into great detail on like isostatic uh, changes, the vertical changes in Earth's crust due to uh, glacial loading and unloading, which can totally explain. Then I looked at the empirical evidence for um, substantial subsidence along the mid-Atlantic ridge due to the um, introduction of literally thousands of trillions of tons of glacial meltwater. And I explained isostasy and how that works and eustasy, which is the, the, the rise and fall of global sea levels due to the expansion and contraction of glaciers and how all of that worked together. And then I also pointed out something very interesting is that in Timaeus, when uh, Plato really sort of the, the preface to his whole story of Atlantis, is he recites the myth of Phaeton. Mm, it's very interesting. Yeah, and he says this has the appearance of, of a myth, but it really signifies a declination of the bodies orbiting in the heavens around the earth and a great conflagration of things after long intervals of time. 
So he's right there. He's invoking cosmic impact right at the very beginning of his story, which to me is not just, uh, you know, coincidence. I think that that was very auspicious that he put that right at the beginning of the story. I think that was deliberate. Mm, that's excellent. Yeah, I, I agree. And, um, I tried to spend, it's, it's an odd at the face value or at a glance, it's an odd read that, that part of the, uh, the intro to Timaeus where that myth is laid out. I thought, man, I got to read that again to try and wrap my head around what it's actually talking about because it was my first exposure, uh, to that story. But boy, when you get thinking about it, it's it doesn't look very mythological. It looks almost like uh, he's got some scientific appreciation for um, reality, I'll, I'll call it. And uh, it's told in the form of stories, uh, almost perhaps so as to uh, make sure that the... Um, the uh, what does Graham Hancock call it? There's this terrible amnesia that we labor under uh, this human amnesia phenomenon but yeah i mean it it, it comes from a the book um you know by velikovsky called mankind in amnesia oh is that where it comes from yeah that was the right. origination of that that concept that we're yeah we're laboring under this suppression of our yeah s- species memory um mm-hmm. yeah graham uh yeah he has a, a term for it um it escapes me at the moment but and he uses that term in his America before as well. And um, but I I like the idea that perhaps among other reasons, myth mythology uh, is a useful mechanism for the transmission. I mean, it's on Hamlet's Mill's uh, book cover. It's it's a mechanism for the transmission of uh, human knowledge through time, and to make sure that certain things just never fade from human consciousness. Exactly, and interestingly. I think that many venues of human, say, activity and human, um, you know, the traditions and stuff actually convey more than meets the eye. You know, the things things we take for granted, for example. I mean, I've done a whole presentation just like on Halloween and the connection of Halloween with the Torrid Meteor stream. And that Halloween, and and showing how um, how universal this idea of the Day of the Dead is, um, you know, all over the ancient world, there was the Day of the Dead commemorated on or about late October, early November, and our Halloween, which is followed by All Souls and All Saints Day, was a three day celebration, and we can go back and find many cultures that had a three day celebration commemorating the end of the world. That was the origin of the Day of the Dead. And I've done a whole presentation on that, which I'm going to update soon, um, talking about the, the, the correlation. And, and then I find that that's a, a, a salient example of how something that has a, apparently innocuous meaning, if any at all, actually may have roots very deep into our past and actually you know, all of these things, you know, look, Christmas, which we now celebrate on the 25th, you know, if you understand the solstitial movement of the sun during that annual cycle, it reaches its, uh, from the sub perspective of the Northern hemisphere, it reaches its, uh, uh, southernmost rising position on the horizon on the 21st to the 22nd. And then it pauses there for a few days. So solstice literally means the sun standing still, right? So it pauses, it reaches that southernmost, and from, let's see, that would be this way from where I'm sitting, and then it pauses there for several days, two to three days, and then it starts coming back again. So you every day, if you're watching the position of the sunrise on the horizon, from, from the summer solstice, where it's as far north as it's going to get, Each day for six months, it's rising farther and farther south. And the days are cooling. The days are getting shorter and shorter. So you essentially could see the darkness is is beginning to dominate. Light is beginning to decrease. And, of course, the further north you are, the more extreme that dichotomy is between day and night, right? But then you get to December 22nd, uh, winter solstice. The sun pauses there, give it a few days, and now 
we, you get up in the morning and you look at the rising and you can now see that the sun is returning, the return of the sun, the return of the light. And now that's a big cause for celebration because, yeah, it's the, the light is returning. And Well, that's really a beautiful thing. Uh, and yet, you know, sometimes the Christian Christmas tradition is demonized as having pagan roots. But uh, if you can appreciate some of the astronomical um, uh, backstory there, it's really a marvelous, beautiful symbol. Absolutely. And to me, that does not detract from the power and beauty and, 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 and legitimacy of Christianity. It adds to it. It adds to it. It seems to me that there's kind of this fundamentalist tendency to want to constrict, you know, why would God, you know, you're saying, well, I mean, we know from the Bible itself, it says that a thousand years is but one day to the Lord, right? And we know also from the, the Hebrew account of Genesis that the, that the term yom, yod mem, which was tr is generally translated as day, simply meant a cycle of light. And so it's like, okay, you want to make the earth 7,000 years old. I say God works in much grander timescales than that. You know, um, why do you want to constrict the handiwork of God to one specific place, one specific time? Um, that's just my, I have a very universal, um, I would say, conception of Christianity. So I find Christianity validated by the fact that it's part of this greater network of spirituality that goes back who knows how far and is in its own way sort of a a sort of a recasting a an upgrading an updating of this ancient spiritual understanding in a new valid uh, expression for the time that it emerged on the planet 2000 years ago and we could get into some time discussing yeah, the yeah. whole thing. And of course, I got to warn you, it'll be my my version of Christianity is a little going to be controversial. But um, I approach it with the same attitude that I do everything else. I look at the. You might be canceled. I could. We might be. have to cancel you if you uh, <laughs> say something we don't agree with. Right. Well, we'll we'll see. We, we it would be fun to get into that. It, yeah. I think because I've looked at a lot of I've studied into the origin of Christianity. And um, I've got some things to say about it, which to me do not in any way diminish the power or value of Christianity. But from where I'm looking at it, if, it's almost like, well, wait a minute, we're, we can almost scientifically validate hmm. the origins of Christianity. And yeah. so there's some interesting things we could get into. Well, I think, um, you know, those are really interesting um, talking points and ideas that maybe merit ending the episode with those ideas and uh, planning to pick up the discussion uh, in the future. Um, and and, and I, I think where we'll pick it up is the Torrid Meteor Stream that you said is important to get back into as we uh, try and, uh, I think, help broaden our perspective of the, uh, what you call it, the cosmic ecology that we yes. humans and the Earth are a part of. And uh, I'm hoping that Space Force professionals are listening in to this and other episodes. Well, me too. And I'll, I'll give La Randall the last uh, word in that regard, and then we'll close up this episode. All right. Officially. Well, well, I'm a hundred percent with you is that I really think that, um, I think that we are created on this planet to become cosmic. I think that's really our destiny. And what happens, you know, I, I when you, when I first heard of space force, I thought that was uh, tremendously exciting. And I thought, this is exactly, I thought this for decades that we need, uh, that we need to be looking at we're the guardians of this planet. And generally, you know, when you start talking about these things, the impacts and, and all of this, people generally, it's outside their day to day purview. It's kind of, uh, relegated to the realm of science fiction, but it's not. It's not science fiction. I'm this is what I'm trying to show. I'm trying to show that from every perspective we look at it, it's a very real phenomenon. And that we need to come to terms with that and plan uh, a long-term survival strategy that has to in include that dimension mm. of things. Yeah. Or, or we're going to go the way of 
many previous civilizations that rose, flourished, and then, for whatever reason, declined and disappeared. Well, you know, uh, one of the things you said earlier reminded me of um, recent discoveries at Gobekli Tepe, uh, ancient Turkey. We're talking the same time period, and I don't, we, we maybe shouldn't get into it, maybe I shouldn't even have brought it up uh, here, but, you know, we're talking again the, the 12 and 13,000 year ago time period in which, uh, contra contrary to what many people would like to think, not only were they potentially seafaring people in these ancient uh, societies, but they're building these megalithic structures uh, in ways that uh, we would find unlikely for people who only know how to uh, tie arrows onto sticks and hunt and, and gather. And I mean, th there's really remarkable things. And here's one of the critical things I thought of earlier as you were discussing um, uh, the, these impactors as, and, and as we invoked yet again the idea of the great year, there is potentially evidence that in addition to having the know-how to build something as marvelous as Gobekli Tepe, they also potentially had some foresight to try to preserve or protect that structure before a coming cataclysm, and then maybe even try to repair or remake some of that uh, at, at various times. But it's like it was buried with sand, if I'm not mistaken. It was buried. And so either there's this grand cosmic ecology that was potentially understood, or maybe the prophetic role came into play and there were men uh, or women that were warning about a coming cataclysm. And we see this, I mean, that's a biblical theme as well. Before the destruction comes, uh, messengers warning that there's things that are going to um, transpire and you better get prepared and you better get right. And, um, and so there are individuals that play that prophetic role, I think, in every age of the world. Yeah, I guess I, I'm wanting to jump in and say one comment about Gobekli Tepe. And, and my first impression when I first learned that Gobekli Tepe had been buried, um, you know, as a student of uh, the arms race and nuclear strategy for years, first thing I thought of when I they buried it, well, I'm thinking super hardened command and control centers, missile silos, they're buried to protect them against the effects of nuclear blast. That's why they're buried, right? And somebody buried Gobekli Tepe. And then, of course, I thought about the similarity between, you know, hypervelocity impact events and nuclear detonations, a la Tunguska, and the idea that nuclear detonations are usually going to be atmospheric because the radius of destruction is greater. This is why, you know, uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki were not bombs that, fell and hit the ground and exploded. They were detonated in the atmosphere. And there was a strategic reason for that because the radius of destruction was much greater. But burying our capable, our, our nuclear facilities is the way we are going to protect them from the blast. The, and, and so that was the first thing that came to my mind. Not that I'm implying nuclear war, but the, 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 the effects of blast, cosmic blast. Um, I don't know. I, of course, I don't know. I don't know the, the motive to burying it, but I couldn't help but think that might be uh, enough of a motive right there. Yeah, and I, I understand that the effort that a people would have had to go to to bury such yeah. uh, a structure was uh, phenomenal. Right, uh, exactly. A phenomenal undertaking. Right. It's phenomenal as, almost as creating the structure in the first place. Right. If this was doing a bombardment epoch, yeah, maybe they're going, yeah, we've got to do something to preserve this. And so it's going to be very interesting to see what develops out of that in the incoming years as they right. as they further uncover the enormous uh, infrastructure that's there. Well, perhaps they had experienced some recent bombardment that gave them warning that they better prepare for it in the future. Yes, yes. And, uh, you know, I can't imagine how we might change as a society. Hopefully, we'd, if you had another Tunguska event over a city, uh, you, what kind of change would that trigger for the century that would follow? You just, I think you just hit the nail on the head, and I've said this repeatedly for years. It may take a shock of that nature to wake us up. Because, yeah, because if you have another, if we have a repeat of Tunguska today, it's going to be headline news all over the world, especially if there's uh, 
major mortality associated with it. And at that point, what has been relegated to the realm of science fiction becomes very, very real. Yeah. Well, Randall, thanks for joining for this episode, and I'll look forward to chatting with you again very soon. Likewise, Matt. I've enjoyed it thoroughly.